about stuff that might happen three and four and five and ten years out. The closer we get to it, apparently more and more humans are in the same wavelength and they start picking it up and we get greater number of leaks. Therefore, we get a little bit more detail. That's like our short-term data. And as we get real close to it, lots of people can sense it. And so they start uh, triggering their psychic impressions and those come out and so we get a little bit more details so that's sort of the the mechanism by which it goes so we've had credit freeze for a long time and uh fundamentally one of the major side effects that you and i will experience is what we call the just-in-time failure the just-in-time supply system you have to think of uh 1940s end of the war uh, Peter Drucker goes to Japan. Uh, he creates in Japan because they were just destroyed. He helps uh, MacArthur rebuild the country, and they decide on a model called the just-in-time supply system. And that's where the carriers, the truckers, basically, are your warehouses. You just don't build warehouses anymore. You sell off all the property, and you devote the money to a different system. That's where we're at now. The Western world adopted this model over the 50s, and it's now going to fail. It depends on ever-increasing cheaper energy, ever-increasing cheaper credit. Neither of those is true anymore. Uh, so we won't be able to do that. In fact, it's already started to fail. The top shipper, second shipper um, uh, globally, Han Jin, uh, number two shipper of goods around the planet, is in bankruptcy and in chaos, and its ships are not hauling anymore. doesn't seem to matter because no one's buying so much anymore here in the U.S. because of our problems with our money being so destroyed. But the credit freeze will take that up to the next level as number three, four, five, and six, and number one shippers fail. And then when they fail, they'll be failing under the impetus of the uh, they don't have credit to pay their employees nor to front the fuel costs, etc. So we're going to see real chaos as loads get uh, ships and loads and crews become, you know, um, abandoned and stuck in various ports and the system breaks down all around the planet. And so that will be a very major concern, is the just-in-time supply system is going to fail. That's what the government's going to be responding to. They're not going to do much in the way of trying to deal with the foreclosure issues insofar as what we see in our data. Because imagine, okay, uh, here's a scenario. Now, I'm not saying that all of the description here will be accurate, but this will give you an idea of what we're sort of looking at. Imagine a situation where Trump's being installed. He's not bringing in cronyism. He's not bringing in a giant mass of uh, crony-connected uh, deep politicians. Therefore, these guys don't know a damn thing about running a giant government, which is not like running a, a real business. And so there's going to be a period of adjustment that will probably last 18 months or longer because the deep state is going to be obstructing and fighting these guys every step of the way. And then when they're taking a break, uh, break from the fight, the deep state's going to be trying to pull the rug out from underneath them just standing there. It's going to be very vicious at that level. These individuals will not be able to address, the, that is to say, the people that are being brought into a new government will not be able to address the real problems that are besetting uh, the populace in their fight with the occupying banks. And so at the same time, we're going to have the just-in-time supply system crash because those same banks are the ones that fund this weird credit system that gets the McFries to you and, you know, uh, puts um uh, you know, uh, potatoes on the table and that kind of thing, right? So there's going to be people that are at the top that will certainly be freaking out uh, about everything that's going on and trying to do everything they can. But I don't really necessarily, and they, they are what we sort of think of, of when we use that word government. But government's got a huge connotation. It's everything from the, the uh, El Presidente all the way down to the FEMA guy that's either going to give you a bottle of water or throw you into a camp. And so what are we actually talking about? They're desperate to do that because the banksters don't want to admit uh, well, let me stop and say, humans are really funny. We always bring on ourselves, because of the nature of universe, that challenge that we need to face. And so here the bankers are trying desperately to destroy cash. And if you think if you have all of these people out on the Internet that are prof um, uh, offering ideas as to why this is the case, that they need more control, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and if you only have uh, digital things, they can control you down to your, your nads and you know pull you on the short hairs by threatening to do away with your bank account. And none of that is true. Or it's all true, but it's none of it is meaningful. The bankers are trying to uh, destroy cash as their part of the system because they're vulnerable to it. They're hugely vulnerable to it because there's only a little tiny bit of um, real money these days and a huge amount of uh, derivatives on that, that real money that actually exists. 
And so the um, uh, the problems that they have are cash based, but not the way we think. We're going to have a cash crisis. And it's because there is not going to be enough money, actual currency, circulating through the real economy to support their paper games anymore. They were trying to get us all to shift into their virtual sim world and play with their sim money 100% of the time and get away from the cash that really is the underpinning. If you look at this thing called base money supply, you see how vulnerable we are. We have a population that's uh, hugely inflated, uh, it's twice the size as it was in 1947. We have a debt structure that's perhaps 100 times inflated over what it was in 1947, but we only have 2% more actual circulating money going on in, in society, and that's where economy actually exists. And what they were hoping to do was to speed up um, uh, circulation by making it all digital. And they've got us all into a digital world, but they're still dependent on that base money, and it's got them kind of, um, got them by the short hairs. And so we're going to run into a big crunch here, a big credit freeze, at the same time that we find we're cash strapped. That same deflationary wave has caused hyperinflation in Venezuela, Argentina, Zimbabwe, Kenya, uh, Hungary, Uzbekistan, and so on, and, and now it's about ready to hit Europe. It'll hit here probably March or April. We'll get, start getting into the hints of hyperinflation. Uh, right now, how often do you actually touch anything close to money in your daily life? I mean, you as an individual. Mostly the people that are, say, uh, even in, in my age group, they're dealing with the plastic cards. And, and as the system locks up, you know, if your plastic card doesn't work, how are you going to pay for something at Safeway or Starbucks or someplace or buy gas or whatever? For a while, there will still be uh, stuff in the in the supply system. So we live right now without warehouses. So if we were to look at ourselves as a social body, we don't uh, have um, big, giant fat repositories lying around. We're existing on the fat that's being pumped around in our blood. And it's going to dry up. Our blood's going to get leaner. And so at that point, we don't have those extra reserves. And, and you're going to run into this situation. It's hit all of the countries as the, as the uh, dollar has uh, died. Uh, the, we're in an empire. The empire is based on the dollar the way the British Empire was based on the pound sterling. We're replicating history. This happens all the time. Uh, empires die from the periphery. Part of our periphery was Argentina, Venezuela, Greece, you know, Hungary, all these countries that, that were uh, dollar-based on their own currency. So we see it there first, so let us not be surprised when it hits, you know, Florida, New Hampshire, California, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, my, apology, <laughs> my apologies to you if you're popping in and <laughs> listening to me for the very first time. Um, but in any event, so uh, at the moment, this is a recording for a metals. Let's start off here with our um, Ponzi scheme of the... Um, uh, paper debt markets and the U.S. dollar, all of these kind of things, and their relationship to the uh, monetary metals of silver and gold. Uh, you'll note within our data sets we had this uh, very uh, prescient, uh, scary prescient, uh, scary accurate, so far anyway, um, set of circumstances in which the data set said we're going to go up through 408, come down, go back up, uh, come down, go back up through 408 again, and then bounce around a lot, and then go through 428. And that the day we went through 428, that was the day that silver was going to start this rise. Now, we note that that did occur. The 408, uh, initial couple of 408s were in the early part of November. We did have the word rapid with the uh, transit through 408 three times for Bitcoin. Sorry, this is all about Bitcoin, and, and it's cross-linked over to silver. Uh, but the Bitcoin transit through 408 uh, U.S. dollars up through 428 in this range was spoken uh, of in the data sets as a bespoke data set that went through it and said we'd go through it three times uh, in a rapid fashion. And I think we have to agree that in the markets, something occurring over a course of a month uh, is probably fairly rapid. And that once we went through 428 and uh, there was a floor established for Bitcoin at 428, then we would also have established a floor for silver. And apparently that is the case so far. Uh, we'd been up and down through, uh, revisited 428 
uh, a number of times. Yes, we'd gone through it and stayed above it, but every day we were coming back down and retesting it. I didn't. I don't follow these things that that closely, so it was only by looking at a chart of the last week of the action that you can actually see that that occurs. And then we go through 428 on Bitcoin, and we hold, and then we stay up there. Now, uh, the connection to silver was that silver has virtually the same emotional profile in our work, in our webbot work, and you should go check us out at uh, halfpasthuman.com if you're unfamiliar with this, if you're running into this for the first time. The Bitcoin was going to go through uh, 428, it was going to hold 428 as a floor, and on that day we would also have a floor that was set up for silver. And it would just be coincident. I mean, they're not linked, and it's you know one doesn't cause the other or anything. But within the prescient level, within the uh, forecast of what we were doing, uh, they were uh, temporally uh, coincident. And it seems that that's the case. That whatever it was, 1338 or 1362 or whatever number it was uh, for silver on that day, that was that's apparently going to be the low. And um, and it's just interesting that the way that this all worked out, we have this occurring about the same time as the uh, Fed meeting. Now the forecast for the 428 through 4, or excuse me, 408 through 428 uh, range goes way back. Goes back like uh, July, August when we first started discussing this sort of thing, and then it really developed over September. And uh, got into the details in September and uh, shared those, and it's been out on the internet and and. Everybody said I was crazy, and well, coincidentally, maybe I was quite crazy, but it in, did indeed work out that way, that Bitcoin coincidentally transited this range three times through the 408 to 428, and then uh, went up, and and we had this, uh, apparently, the beginning of the rise in silver. I understand that silver went down. Manipulation and that kind of thing is not an issue. We're not talking about it going up every day. We're talking about a significant rise reaching a plateau in silver. Now, the language for the significant rise and the uh, uh, reaching a plateau for silver is coincident, uh, temporally coincident again with a uh, major um, uh, developing debacle within the paper debt markets. And the debacle is basically a shredding or a um, crumbling, uh, corroding. Uh, some of the other words we had uh, would relate to the market ending up looking like Swiss cheese, you know, big holes being punched through it. Uh, they're just all kinds of descriptors for the market basically getting shredded, just getting uh, crushed over a, a period of time that brings it up to uh, March and April of this coming year. And by the market, I'm talking about the U.S. equities market. That's the one that's being referenced most normally within our data sets, simply because we started off in English so long ago. Anyway, though, um, uh, comes on up to the Dow and all of this kind of stuff, the USA um, uh, paper debt markets uh, going into a big fall over the course of two months in March and April of 2016. Now, uh, the plateau in silver is reached prior to that. That is to say that silver, according to the data sets, will rise up uh, significantly. Uh, and I'll get into that word set in a minute. Uh, but it'll rise up significantly, and then it'll reach a plateau that holds as other events take over uh, all of our minds and occupy what we're uh, paying attention to, and as uh, the mechanics of the silver market break down, and the, or the precious metals market. So uh, the holding in price um, uh, language is really referencing uh, not everybody deciding, okay, it's worth this much and no more, you know, $60, $80, it doesn't matter what it, what it chooses uh, to be the price. The, the numeracy is not pertinent. The emotional descriptors go to the idea that uh, people would like to buy silver, they'd be willing to pay more for silver, but the mechanics in the market actually break down such that nobody can trade silver, and thus we have a, a period of time in which we have a plateau that is going to be, according to the data sets, uh, um, a very interesting, very tense, uh, worrisome time, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, and uh, will we'll break in a reasonably short period, about 35 days, uh, and it, it breaks because of something else, because of a new development, which I won't go into at this point. And um, the, uh, uh, quote, price discovery during that period of time is pegged. It's just simply held at what the last price was. No, no silver is trading. In the gold market, during that same period of time, the language is describing the gold market as having gone uh, uh, 
no offer, meaning nobody's offering gold for sale. There'd be plenty of people offering money to buy it, <laughs> but, but nobody's willing to put out, um, or excuse me, plenty of people offering currency to buy it, <laughs> but no one's willing to sell their gold, which is money. And so we get this period of no offer. Now, the no offer on gold goes a lot longer than this temporary um, uh, market uh, breakdown uh, for silver that the data is forecasting for this upcoming year. I'm getting into a lot of the stuff that's in our uh, upcoming report for January. So if you want more details on this kind of thing, you can you can go and check out our report when it when it comes out. Uh, but I thought I'd give everybody a little bit of a preview and, and uh, a skirt and dance around some other issues for uh, reasons that you'll find apparent here. Now, the rise in silver, the, the wording we have on the rise in silver is the word is significant. So the uh, that's the descriptor set. I'm sorry, in terms of the set, that's like the label at the very top. And then we go into this little pyramid of uh, gradually increasing detail as we go further and further and further down. As we get closer and closer to the event, we, we gather more of the detail language. And so we can get a broader, uh, much more emotionally descriptive set of words as opposed to simply significant. Because bear in mind, I've been discussing this rise in silver, this particular rise in silver for this year based on the Bitcoin coincidence temporally in this um, particular range. I've been discussing this since August. And so the word significant over the time that, that descriptor set has grown and we now have a much more uh, clear picture of what the data is trying to describe. And it's not talking about, it's describing the action for silver relative to um, uh, what, what we might think of as like chart patterns as opposed to giving me any particular set of numbers. Sometimes we get numbers, it's very rare. So the 408 to 428 for Bitcoin was extremely rare. Uh, it comes up maybe once a year if we're lucky in our, um, in our work. Uh, it's it, because we throw out most numbers and very few numbers on the internet are actually typed out as numbers and come through as words. So uh, it, it becomes a, uh, a problematic issue. When they, when they do appear, they're really important. As we've discovered when it forecast 300,000 dead uh, in the Banda Achi quake eight months before it occurred that number was was incredibly prescient. So numeracy, when it actually occurs in a, uh, a, a textual description of a numeral, uh, we do pay attention to. Now, we do not have that for silver at the moment. Previously, we had had indications that it would be about 60 to six, or 62 to $68 uh, at the time that it went into a plateau. Now, those numbers came up before the descriptors for the significant rise, the Bitcoin, and the uh, flow that led us to where we're at at the moment. That is to say, the conjunction or juxtaposition of our particular uh, forecast with the events as they've unfolded. So I made forecast back in uh, August and September about the, the what would happen be happening with Bitcoin when silver started to go up. Silver did nothing until the uh, Fed made their error. But now bear in mind also we've been des describing the uh, Fed's decision as uh, being an error way back in August. Uh, we were describing uh, that they would make a bad decision at the end of November time period uh, that would really affect everything. Um, in any event, though, so the word significant in this case is describing, uh, is being um, uh, linguistically described in a fashion that we could read as a chart. And if we were to look at this in a, those, that language in a ch chart uh, manner, then we would see that the actual cash out of out of your pocket to obtain some silver uh, in the upcoming months when we reach the plateau uh, will clearly be uh, double what we're looking at now. Uh, so in that sense, that's that's the minimum level of, of what we see as significant within the descriptor set we've got right now is, is a 100% increase in the actual cost to, to take delivery of that ounce. And I say that, and, and I say this because we're not looking at the data doesn't know about um, uh, spot price versus uh, 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 you know uh, on the street market delivery price or eBay or any of that. It describes this sort of stuff in a very much uh, broader fashion, and um, uh, the way in which it's actually describing it, it literally is actually getting it in hand. So we have the in hand and out of pocket language, this kind of thing, to say actual costs involved. And delays it because it also speaks in cost and time and energy. Uh, not in this particular instance, but in other cases, we'll see uh, the data come up with uh, things about the cost and energy. 
Uh, but in this case, we've got a cost in time to obtain silver, and we've got a cost in, in currency. And the data sets are referencing the significant um, uh, step up, which is going to be clearly, uh, which is now clearly more clearly described as being what we would think of as like a 100% increase. Now, this may not be a 100% increase in the spot price. I have no way of knowing that. Uh, what we're looking at is a actual cost to get it into your hands. So if right now you had to pay, pay $22, including shipping, to get an ounce mailed to you from uh, the local or, or through through uh, Internet, through um, uh, what are they called, the primary dealers or whoever they, these guys are that get it from the mints, then uh, you could figure that we'd be looking at $40 or $45 to get that same ounce at the time that we hit this plateau before the mechanisms break down. That could be a couple of weeks. Uh, it could be um, uh, a couple of days, for all I know. But what we, because we don't have a description of it that way, our description of it is that we basically take these series of steps up, uh, not crocodile teeth, the way you have this up and down market action. True, there will be down days, and some days where uh, you go up one day and then the next day is deliberately engineered to get you even with the day before, and so there's no gain. So it talks about that in in the um, data sets. But overall, we're going to be reaching towards this uh, significant rise, which we'll see as a 100% uh, increase in the actual cost of getting it, you know, what you've got to dig into your pocket for to get that ounce of silver and actually have it in hand. And it, in that cost, it's also talking about time delays, which in some cases could be many weeks. So we have a clue there as to how long the period of time for the rise will take relative to the period of time for the plateau. Uh, I hope that makes a lot of sense, or any sense at all. Uh, linguistically, we have to hook all these clues together in a Sherlock Holmes fashion, construct a narrative in our head, test it against the, the model, test it against reality to make sure that it's a, that there's a, at least some hope in hell that it'll appear, and then um, <laughs> we put it out in our reports and, and cross our fingers and we see where we're at. And, and it's, it's usually a little bit better than chance. Uh, actually, it's in some cases quite... Uh, quite a bit better than chance, and we've been really pretty good because of the uh, lexicon tuning I've been doing, which I won't go into at the moment. But but um, uh, so to finish on the silver issue and the gold issue, we're going to go over these uh, period of rises, and then we're going to hit this market pegging period, which is temporally temporally coincident with and flows into our paper um, um, crumbling, crushing. Uh, stuff that culminates in a March-April uh, destruction, really huge level of destruction of debt at the paper level. And disruptions, um, we have uh, data sets for things like uh, countries' postal systems being shut down because there's no money suddenly to fund uh, the people that are trying to deliver the mail. Not necessarily U.S., uh, but it, it'll be hitting the language. So, so we have all of these kind of uh, language, uh, all this kind of language for a great deal of disruption uh, during this period of time, and it gets worse from there, of course. But these are some of the signs that we'll see that we're entering into this just very terrible period of time, this uh, year of manifestation of uh, your worst fears, probably. Um, in any event, though, so uh, so that's it about the uh, precious metals at the moment. Just to let everybody know where we're at, we've we've actually linguistically fulfilled the Bitcoin um, range cross. Uh, we we've set our our apparently set our floor for silver. It's going to start rising over the next uh, period of time into this uh, uh, until it reaches a plateau, and then it's going to smack out as um, um, and just sit. Uh, for the maybe 35 days, 35 trading days, we think. Uh, there's just some, some indications of that uh, that range. And at that point thereafter, then we hit a really interesting period with hyperinflation and the silver price goes crazy along with the prices of a lot of other things. Um, but the, there's going to be a huge chunk of um, uh, debt destruction. I don't know if that qualifies as, as um, deflation, but it certainly is going to be devaluation. That's going to go over this, the first quarter and into the end of um, uh, this March-April uh, downturn. So uh, that's where we're at. Uh, if it helps to know that, um, you know, better act on it. Uh, we're, we're getting so close, things are manifesting right and left. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when now. <coughs> My WebBot forecasts are forecasts of the future that are prepared by a process of 
uh, predictive linguistics that's basically deep data mining on the web, and it obtains some pretty spooky results. Uh, I've been asked to provide three reasons to read these reports because they're somewhat long. And the world's big, uh, time is limited, there's much more uh, interesting and, you know, fun things to draw your attention. So this guy has a legitimate question, you know. He's saying, why should he waste his time? And uh, so I decided to make this video and say, okay, here's why. And rather than go all into all these different kinds of reasons, I just decided to give you three examples, three reasons in a sense. Well, sort of two reasons and an opinion. We'll see when we get there. Uh, uh, today, by the way, is August 20th, uh, 2016. As with everything I do, time is important, so sometimes in the future it's going to be necessary to note this. Um, I'd received an email from this woman who's been reading my reports for a long time. She uh, came across them in um, 2008, I think she said, and maybe it was early 2009. It was right after the financial crisis, uh, this last one got really rolling. Uh, she just retired maybe a few months before it had happened had um, fortunately sold her house. Uh, she was a school teacher. Um, I won't go into all of the details, but she sold her house before uh, everything really went kablooey in the real estate market. And so she had a bit of money besides her, her very, very meager pension uh, from being a school teacher for most of her life. And so uh, she uh, started reading my reports in, um, as I say, about 2008, 2009. Uh, I first heard from her um, uh, mostly recently, about, say, two years ago. Uh, anyway, so the situation was she had some money, uh, she had a retirement account, and she realized by, two, uh, by sometime in 2009, 2010, that her money was being eaten away faster uh, by the banks than by her spending it. And so it was a real problem for her. Oh, by the way, uh, she, she found my reports because she was looking for the most pessimistic view she could find because she said, obviously, we're into it in a deep way uh, in 2008, and she wanted to see stuff that was beyond her level of thinking so that she could get a bit prepared. And, you, you know, at that point, you really didn't get much more pessimistic than, <laughs> than my reports because we were deep into it, and that's all that the uh, reports were generating. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> so she stumbles across my reports. And uh, she tells me she was fascinated by so much in it, she kept reading it long after uh, she got the gist of the economic stuff. And she just kept getting them year after year. Um, anyway, so as I said, her retirement was getting eaten away. Uh, and then uh, and she said one day in 2012, she just decided to do something about it. She had the nest egg that was just being eaten away. It was from her house. She was living in a rented place at that point. Um, and uh, it was being eaten away, too, by inflation and uh, not being able to invest it and get any return on her, on her income. So she decided to do something that I'd been talking about in my reports in 2012 and since then. And in 2012, I was really big on it. And yes, you got to do this. you got to do this, guys. you really got to do this. And uh, because at that point, I was convinced. Now, I'd run across this <clears throat> way back when, but I, it took me a couple of years to be sure that I was going to be offering advice that, that would stand the test of time that I would be able to look myself in the, in the mirror, you know, in 2020 and say, yeah, I did right by those people. That was really good advice. And so far, I've been proven correct on this. Anyway, uh, long story, cut it short, uh, she started buying Bitcoin as it was going down. And she bought it first, she said, at like 75 cents, and it went down to about 30 cents, and then she's been buying it ever since. She's got a lot of Bitcoin, a lot of Bitcoin. Um, <clears throat> because she didn't trust banks, she didn't know what else to do. She, she said she was, you know... An uh, 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 old retired teacher, she didn't want to have stuff in her apartment that people could steal, so she wanted something that people couldn't steal, and she really liked the idea that they couldn't steal her Bitcoin as long as she kept the key in her head. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, she got, has a lot, of, a lot of Bitcoin, and she wrote to me recently and was thanking me for this, saying, uh, thank you for getting me into Bitcoin. Uh, I rode that Bitcoin down on the way, when she was starting to buy, I was writing it down from like $30, and it went down to, I don't know, well under, uh, well under a buck, and then bounced right back. So, guys, Bitcoin crashes are nothing. Anyway, so she's been through a couple of them with me, and she just wrote to me a little while ago, saying that, you know, she's really profited from this, and she needed some more advice. Uh, and she made some more money off of some other information in one of my reports, and wanted to know what to do with it, because, as she said, she's got to get the money off the table. And so uh, I'll tell you in a minute what I wrote to her. Um, so now my second example is from somebody who profited by not doing something, okay? And this, guy's ha this is happening in real time, more or less, as I'm recording this uh, today, uh, Saturday. Uh, this was a guy who um, 
uh, is a retired fellow. Uh, he's living in Puerto Rico. He and his wife were scheduled to go on a uh, Caribbean cruise. And he, he just wrote me an email. He got it like 20 minutes ago. And he said he had a, a queasiness, a funny feeling in his gut. Uh, they were supposed to go a couple of days ago. And he said, no, nah. he said, you just didn't feel right about it. He got up that morning and he thought he was actually going to be sick. But he felt fine, really sort of fine the day before, but it just kept coming on him. And it kept being associated with them going. So he told his wife about this. And she says, well, they didn't have to go. And by the way, wasn't it funny because uh, the reports that she'd been reading, she just bought this last August Alta report, talked about a Caribbean cruise ship fire. And that really set him off. He didn't really read the report so much. You know, he did when she insisted, but he kind of thought she was a loon. <laughs> anyway, not so much anymore. Uh, because, of course, as he says here, um, um, let me see, he said they decided to give in to the funny feeling and not go. And so he, and the next line says, uh, he and his wife were able to stay home and watch uh, their cruise ship burning alive on, on TV in real time as people were being rescued by helicopters. And he said that, you know, that would have been us. <laughs> so anyway, so he was very, very appreciative. And he said, you know, he's not going to give his wife any, any trouble for reading the reports in the future. And he's going to start paying attention to them. Uh, the reason he wrote, uh, he actually said it was the best decision that uh, he'd made listening to her uh, in 23 years of marriage. Uh, but anyway, he uh, was emailing to ask about their next trip because they've got one planned for this fall. And, and I'll tell you in a minute what I, uh, what I told him. Actually, more to his wife. But anyway, uh, so now my third example is also still happening, all right? And this one is more of an opinion. Uh, and I'll just tell you flat out, I don't have any email from these guys yet. Uh, 